Hey guys, this is John Bokenkamp, the creator of The Blacklist. You are listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Well, we've got a special treat for you here on the week off of The Blacklist. Good evening, everybody. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and we have a lot, a lot to talk about. We're going to talk to Mr. John Bokenkamp, the creator, executive producer, Godfather. I don't know what other titles he has, but we're going to talk about his episode that's coming up, which is 821, which hasn't aired yet. And also, we're going to talk about the season as a whole, which is uh, pretty detailed, I would say. We touched some stuff that I, I think you probably thought we wouldn't ask, but we ask it anyway. And you're going to get a lot of Easter eggs, a lot of behind the scenes conversation. This is John throwing out a love letter to you guys, the fans, and we're so happy to do it. So you don't want to hear us. We'll talk on the other end. Here's our interview for season eight with executive producer, creator, and writer of The Blacklist, Mr. John Bokenkamp. Thanks so much, John, for being here. How are you? I'm great. Do you cue lots of applause there? I hope you add applause after the fact. I got a button. Like the Muppet Show. Like a, when they yeah, announce. totally. Yeah, good. Good. I don't know if you listen much these days, but uh, the applause means we're applauding the fact that Tom is dead. So I don't, <laughs> I know, I I don't know if you that. want to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, that, that's what we need to talk about, Aaron, is what is the thing with Tom, with your Tom like uh, obsession? I want to know a little bit about that. I don't like the character. From the beginning, or did it just go astray for you at a certain place? Um, pretty much as soon as you started uh, <laughs> trying to kill his wife, I was a problem with that. Right. And then, and it's nothing against Ryan; it's just the character. And then uh, when he got killed, and was it Ian Garvey? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that was a happy day. It's probably one one of my favorite episodes because I'm like, ah, I got what he get, had coming, and everybody's all moo, and I was, I was yay. And so now, uh, I think I started what this season, Troy, because people always give me grief because I say I, I never liked Tom. I'm fine with him. I'm glad he he can't, got reincarnated on New Amsterdam. Good for him. And uh, I said, I applaud. I just started applauding. And people loved it and hated it. And when people hate things, you just do it more. Then you got to lean so, into it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you lean into it. Yeah. And so I, well, I like it. Yeah. I love listening and hearing that. It is, it's fascinating to me how, how much it bothers you. And I love that even more. And I love it when you guys really push back against each other. And what was the episode? One of those, the, the episode, the week later, you were like, uh oh, is it two? We're fighting, or it's like we, we, uh, yeah, didn't get along. What was the, yeah. the Russian knot? Yeah. Loved hearing that. I love, I love it when you guys go toe to toe. Fight over your creation. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, t- makes, that sounds terrible. Take note, yeah, Brenda. John good. said it's fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It's in good, it's all in good spirits, I think. It's always been a blast working with Aaron for eight years. I mean, it's been great just being here as part of the family, uh, I feel anyway, for the last eight years. Um, we're coming up on some pretty interesting stuff. Um, Townsend has been kind of this foreboding thing since season six. We've met the character this season. Why did you feel season eight was the time to introduce us to Neville? Well, we sort of had to. It's funny. We mentioned him at the end of season six. I remember that. It was like Dembe came in and said something in the last episode. And at the moment, we knew there was another big bad coming, but we didn't know Townsend. You know, we didn't know exactly who he was. And and uh, that that admittedly was one of those where he comes in and says, the Townsend directive is back in action or whatever he said, <laughs> where we get together then, you know, four weeks later and get in the room and go, oh, my God, what does that mean? You know, and what, who, who is Townsend and how does it work? And, you know, we knew there was a, a big bad out there that we had – not met yet who would who was so, that red was afraid of there's a there's an element of winging it to it but um but but again you i think sort of trying to feather together the the high wire act of the improv and then also sort of the pieces of the story that we know is where it kind of gets fun so uh reg has been uh good certainly different than any of the characters we've had on the show and um you know we're having we're having fun with him uh, and specifically where it goes so would you say that then from the, because you talked about this, like C2E2 and a couple of the other interviews that you've had the, we know we're going from Chicago to LA or LA to Chicago, and there's these signposts along the way. Is Townsend one of those signposts that you had from your original idea? Or is this something that came as the show came along? Because it's leading, it's leading to another signpost that we haven't found out about yet. I would say the signpost was the thing that we knew. The, what, what he 
what he represents and what he is what he is to Reddington and who he is to Reddington and, and sort of the what it forces the corner that he forces Reddington into is something that was is the signpost that we knew we were moving toward. Knowing that he was a guy who um you know, was an insomniac and that, you know, that his family in a very parallel sort of way was, was lost, you know, that, that sort of, we didn't, that we didn't, uh, we didn't know. Those are details that get hung on the skeleton. And when did you know this was the season to take Liz and and Red and say, you know what, you guys are just going to go at each other. Like this is, this is the time it's, it's long past time. You know what, Aaron, that's something we talked about for a long time, a long time. And Eisendrath always bumped on, this just can't happen too fast. This can't just, she can't all of a sudden become a bad guy. And look, we put Megan in a hard spot. We put the character in a hard spot for anyone to go in and be a bad guy against Reddington, who is the bad guy of the show. Mm -hmm. It's hard, you know, that's a, that's a tough thing to write. And it's a tough thing for an actor to portray. And, you know, whether it's Reg Rogers or, uh, you know, or Megan or, or anybody who, you know, um, Lila Robbins, you know, the, the people who have to step into that role, that's a, that's a tall order. And, um, in terms of Liz, we always knew that she, I don't know if I want to say always, but it has been a long, long time that we have had the idea that she would, you know, you've seen it happen over years, become more like Reddington, but she, Mm -hmm. she, you know, think like a criminal from the pilot or those seeds where it's like, wow, that's kind of where this person has to go. If she, you know, typically in, in TV shows, at least it used to be the character doesn't change. You know, you want to show up and see, Barney Miller be Barney Miller. You want to see? Sorry for that. That's a super old reference. I res- I understood that reference. I'm Captain America right now. I totally Thank get it. You, yeah. yeah. you want to see Jerry Seinfeld be Jerry Seinfeld. You know, you don't want to. You want to see friends be friends. And so the idea that we would take a character and sort of in a little bit more of a cable sort of arc, where whether it's Walter White or something like that, you want to watch them evolve. And so we knew that we wanted to do that with Liz. Right. That started in you know with her. I, it probably started before, but she shot Tom Connolly. She's stewed people. She's sort of been drawn <laughs> to this darker side of uh, of Red, as have, and you guys have pointed this out, every other character on the show. I mean, they're, they've all, they've probably all murdered somebody or buried a body somewhere, and they should all probably be in jail. But they're drawn into his orbit, and that's, you know... Uh, that's kind of where they go. So that's been a long, that's been in the pro- pro- in progress for a long time, longer than I care to admit. And uh, we finally got there. And you know, the, to the extent that it's working, we'll we'll see. You know, you got to stay tuned, I guess, for that. Can I ask you? It's it's kind of a hard question. So if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. But I, I'm going to ask it anyway. So this this season, I, I feel like Liz has gotten a lot of from from fans they they've not been necessarily on her side they're they're mad that she's going against red da 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 and how could she and he cares for her and everything else and i and i've said multiple times i think i think roughly every episode this season that i'm totally team liz because i get it you know at this point and now now of course he's acknowledging it because you know whatever but for a long time he was not acknowledging it and he's she's been asking for these simple solutions for a long time do you think a lot of that disgust and and problem and and issues that people have with Liz is just because they're going up against their favorite bad guy yeah i do i think you could you could have uh robert redford come in and be the bad guy and and people would be upset you know look mm-hmm. is, is it the way it's written maybe is it you know i mean i'm I, I don't, I don't mean to shrug any of the responsibility of how effective it is or not, but, but I do think that anytime it's one of the hardest things, honestly, about the show. And it's one of the things that was a huge network note from the beginning. And we finally just leaned into it. But I remember in the very beginning, what is wrong with the FBI? The FBI is wrong. The FBI can't be wrong. There are task force, there, this, you know, and it's like, well, guys, this isn't CSI. This isn't law and order. The cops aren't always right. In fact, they're always wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. And, he is the one who is sort of, I mean, how many times has he slapped Harold's hand or talked down to everyone on the, yeah. you know, what was the line at the end of the a couple episodes ago? He's like talking to Park about, I, I look forward to when you're, uh, you know, you mature and basically shut your mouth is what he was saying. And so yeah. it's hard. It's hard for anybody who's going against them 
because of the character, but also because Jay, the way James portrays him, it, I think that's I think that's more what you're pointing out. I think is more about the structure and the DNA of the show versus the character, the way it's written or played or any of that. Although maybe that's part of it, but I I do think that's a that's a tall order. Speaking of characters and relationships on the show, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the humping. Talk about the humping. Exactly right. What's the humping? The humping is the, humping. Is, is the number like one it. question for season eight. Is the fact that you know, people people wanted one. it? Well, I mean, it's it's for most of the fans because they've said for years it's like we love we love to ship our people, right? We have the Lisington people, we had the uh, Saram people, and then there was the Keenlers, and the Keenlers were like super active since like season one. Why did you guys decide season eight? This is the time the Keenlers are going to get a victory. Uh, you know what? Here's the thing about that. Uh, it is really hard. Again, I, I sound like I'm complaining, but one of the things that is very difficult about this show, and again, it's part of the DNA of the show, is there's a girl on a bridge who is going to be killed, or there's a busload of kids hanging over the thing. We call them, you know, muffins on the show. The muffin that we got to go save, the cute little muffin, the muffin of the week that we got to go save. The muffins? I've never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fabulous. muffin. The muffin is always the the. Um, it's the opposite of the McGuffin. <laughs> no, no, it's it's the opposite of the McMuffin. It is the it is the um, whatever. It's the collateral damage. It's the person that we need to save. And okay. so the muffin sort of came from, I think, the cute little girl who was in the pilot, and she's a ballerina, and there's she's just a little muffin, you know, and mm-hmm. you just want to eat her up, and we got to save her. And the more you lean into the muffin that you got to save, the bigger the stakes the show are you know, has the, the more, Oh my God, they're going to blow up the whatever today. It gets really hard to step down and go, Hey wrestler, you want to have dinner? You know, or yeah, like, yeah. Hey, Hey Samar, let's go to a movie tonight. It's like, what are they doing? And so they, the characters end up looking really sort of, um, absent and like they don't care or they don't want to do their job if they're not doing something that's really urgent and so that is one of the reasons i think it was so hard for us to lean into that and i think as the seasons have gone on and i mean if i'm going to be candid about it you know the budgets have gotten tighter this it's it's harder to shoot covid makes it harder to shoot you know it's it's a lot easier to tell a story with two people in a room talking and sort of stepping away from what i think we're you know, some of the elements that made the show work in the first place, which was blowing up cars on bridges and, you know, skyscrapers imploding and saving all the muffins. And so I think that's really why that was able to sort of bubble up now. And it sort of happened. I mean, you sort of could feel that happening, you know. Um, but, yeah, they started out about as opposite as they those two characters could be, from, you know, from each other. You know, wrestler was suspicious of her. She hated him. He, you know, he was the Boy Scout and a cop and. And and I think over time there there was a you guys uh, might remember there was an episode where they were stuck together. I want to say it was season six or maybe season season seven, and they were together. And they for the first time I really felt like I saw their chemistry. It was like wow, they're she's are they kind of flirty? Like there was a you sort of see that in the way they're playing it. And I don't know if that's because the actors get to know each other and are more comfortable or what it is. And so we started leaning into that, I think. And that was um, probably two years ago. Yeah. I think it was maybe Robert Vesco when they were going through all the paperwork piles and it kind of like, they're kind of bantering back and forth as they were digging through trying to find the ship or something. There there was some, there was an episode where there were, there was a woman who had a belly full of like drugs. There were like condoms full of cocaine or something and she was going to die. And there was a, some, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, Yes, there was a moment, and again, Robert Vesco might have been one of those moments where, where you kind of go, "Wow, they're kind of getting along, and this is interesting." And um, yeah, by the way, so here's a little. This is a good little tidbit for you. Their kiss in episode four, three. Did we talk mm-hmm. about that? Have I talked to you guys since then? I don't think so. No, no the, I don't the, think the, so. this is the this is the dupe gun pole kiss. The dupe gun pole kiss under the bridge. So. This is episode, I think it's three um, of the season, and we had just started back production. It's the middle of COVID. It's like, look, it's going to be all on sets. 
there's going to be, you're not going out. It's also post Black Lives Matter. And so we're in a place in the world where New York police are not really excited to have like a bunch of people running around on the streets with guns and doing gunplay. And they're like, Mm -hmm. we, we could not be, we could not be out on the streets with guns. And we had this kiss scripted and Andrew McCarthy is directing the episode and the actor, our testing is extreme. They could not kiss. And they're like, how are we going to produce a kiss? Literally, if you go back and watch that is one of the, I'm so excited about how it was made. So there's footage of Diego kissing a mannequin. Get out of here. No, I'm not kidding you. On his close up, he's kissing a mannequin in a wig. And he's like, he's having a hard time. He's like laughing and he's like, this is ridiculous. Andrew McCarthy, by the way, who I believe was in mannequin, right? Yes, he was. He, yes, he was. Yep. He sure was. Perfect guy to direct this is like, guys, come on, come on, stay in the moment. You're watching the dailies. He's like, they're just like, this is so ridiculous. So Diego and his close up is kissing a, a mannequin in a wig. In Megan's close up, she's kissing a mannequin in a wig. They, they would go right in, like they kind of get close and then they pull away, like in their, in their two shot. And then for the wide shot, look closely, stunt casting where we had doubles come in to kiss the kiss stunt doubles. <laughs> came in to kiss because we couldn't let our actors kiss because they may be spreading COVID. So it was so, I was like, wow, this is a crazy job, right? Like that, that, that that's how they were having to real. produce a kiss. It was pretty crazy. It looked real. I, I feel bad for them. They're like, man, we waited all this time. We don't even it's get to so do it. It's so funny. If you see, if you see the foot, <laughs> if you see the footage of that, it's pretty silly. How it was. That should off. be on a blooper reel because I guarantee you Diego making out with a mannequin would be a highlight. It, believe me, it was it was uh, it was pretty silly to watch. But they are they definitely have their chemistry. So there you have it. So let's talk about this season and the choice that we've done because this hasn't happened before seven years of the blacklist. We went pretty much serialized from day one all the way through now. And maybe a second question on that too would be the Liz episode specifically. Most of the time, we do one of those like retrospective flashback recap when we're like gone for a long break. But we weren't really on a break this year, so why why the Liz choice to kind of give us the backstory at that moment? Which which episode are you talking about with the Liz with the Liz story? No, uh, that would have been the the one where the one right after Anne. So that would have been when we get to see like where she's been, like how she yes, did the yes, chemical yes, marry yes, yes, and all yes, that episode. stuff. Mazir, it, uh, Mazir, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first off, it was it's completely unintentional to it, it was it was not to be candid is as, as we get closer to the end and the beginning, it is harder to hold off on some of the, um, some of the serialized storytelling. And I think that is really, you know, look episode 21, when you watch that and 22, you'll see where we're going and why it's hard to not ramp up to that and hard to not lean into the serialized aspect of the storytelling. I mean, we always sort of fancy the show as a, you know, kind of a hybrid between a, a standalone episode, a little bit of storytelling. I remember uh, getting to know Chris Carter, who would talk about the X Files, and maybe every three or four episodes they do a mythology episode, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what I thought we were doing. And then we're not very good at that. We 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 have a hard time, and and I don't know why this is. The the beginning of each season, the first two or three or four episodes are pretty serialized. You find a, a serialized moment or reveal in the midpoint when we used to go to like, you know, the winter break or whatever. Break, and then yeah. it sort of ramps back up and becomes more serialized in the last couple episodes. This season, for some reason, I don't know why that is. I think it is um, – it's not that it's hard to do the case of the week because that's that's kind of the more simple part. You know, let's – who's a good bad guy? Who's a weird – like, you know – for example, there there is a um, a company that does animal transport. If you buy a uh, a dog from Russia and have it flown to America, or if you have a snake you need sent to uh, Arizona, there's a guy who gets on a plane and travels with your pet and delivers it. That's an episode to me. Like that's a I don't know what he does or what smuggled in the animals or whatever, but that's like the germ of an idea. That sort of stuff I think is much easier and more fun to come up with. But really at the end of the day, I think all people care about is the, the character and, and, and it wasn't intentional for this season to become more serialized. I agree. It has been almost entirely, but um, I think that's just because 
I think it, ultimately I really think that's because of where we're going at the end of the season is, is, is the answer for that. But again, it's not, it's not a conscious choice. I think it just sort of happened. The second question then for Mazir, why decide to go to that Liz retrospective? Why, why show her point of view? Was that a intentional or needed or just a, a break because of what happened in the end episode? Catch or? people up. Yeah. Yeah, I think, look, I mean, Aaron, I, I've listened to the podcast. I understand what your bumps are on some of those episodes where we're kind of keeping Liz alive, but she's not really there. But mm-hmm. we're, you know, the Cyranoid, I thought, that was a Daniel Cerrone idea that I thought was brilliant, the idea that there's sort of a doppelganger and, you know. But more than anything, what we really wanted to do was come back and retell the story through Liz's point of view. Liz had done some crazy things. She was sort of MIA and this sort of mysterious character. Where did she go? And yet, at the same time, we we didn't want to just sort of like, okay, it's episode 14. Here I am. We wanted to, we, we sort of wanted to review the story from her point of view in a way that would be fair to her and a way that would really emotionally step out sort of who she was and why she made the choices that she made. By the way, also, to be super candid, that was a tandem episode. Uh, When I talk about budget shrinking and it being harder to make the show and, you know, the rent goes up at the stages and, uh, you know, all of that happens every year. And and so we we were forced to... We weren't forced, but we, we chose to do a tandem episode where we would shoot two episodes at once. And if you go back and look at that, Red and Liz are only an episode in the sixth act of episode 14. Um, I don't think – and Liz is not in the previous episode. So that was an episode where, all right, 13 with Red and Anne is their story, and there's no – other characters from the task force really in that. And then in the next episode in 14, it's task force, it's Liz, it's other people, but no red and reds only in the last scene. So again, that's when, when I say we sort of, we know where we're going and we have signposts, we do, but then there's these little audibles that you call along the way and go, well, Hey, maybe it'd be cool if we told a red love story. And then if we did the Liz rewind, and those would be two sort of different kinds of stories that would also help us meet our budgetary needs. Was was the Anne episode kind of an, a nugget of an idea to show how much Reddington has given up for this project, so to speak? Uh, uh, you know, the Anne episode is was affectionately, again, for four, five years, called the Applebee's Lady. We have for years <laughs> thought that Red... What? Yeah. So Anne is the Applebee's Lady. And for years, we thought that Red might have... Like, like we had super high concept versions where like in, in, in another version of that story, red um, flies to Kansas city, um, goes home and uh, enters and hangs up his hat and says, hello, honey. And there's his family. And there's his like this alternate reality. Like he's got this total double life. And Mm -hmm. that seemed like maybe a little too much, (laughs) but, but, and so what it evolved into, and we, believe me, we talked about him knowing the Applebee's lady who was basically just, Red sort of has fallen for and knows this woman who works at Applebee's and she's a very pedestrian, normal, salt of the earth type of person who has no idea who he is. We thought that would be a fun episode. And then so we, we, we kicked that around for years and eventually it became maybe we need somebody to just sort of maybe Red needs somebody. Hmm. to just sort of check out like he needs to not be Red. He needs to not have all these problems and be this person. He just wants to be normal. You know, and and so that's that's really where that came from. It was really about trying to service his desire to sort of just check out and want to be a normal person. What I love about Anne, the character, too, is it was like eight years of the show. The fans are still super dedicated. And I mean, just the little things that you add in that make the blacklist what it is. The whole well, I'm watching a, a Kate May warbler. And then you go back and you watch like right, right. you know Katarina come out of the ocean. It's like oh, it's the there was an African American lady that was at the thing. Maybe that's the same person. And if you're a Red Arena fan, and it's like it's just those little things that just keep the audience engaged. And I I'm just shocked that after eight years, you guys can but still keep, make that magic happen. That's what keeps you engaged. Normal people aren't thinking that. <laughs> Here you guys go. <laughs> this is the good stuff. I'll hang up now and let you guys. No, 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 no. Don't no, don't leave no, us. I, look, the, 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 you're right because when they're when they're in the park and they're, she's a bird, when we landed on her being a bird watcher, what are the birds? And you sit down and you start Googling and you go, well, there's this bird and this bird. 
oh my God, there's a Cape, Cape May warp. That's a, okay, let's lean into that. And then you start looking into that. So, so, you know, I, again, some of the stuff that is, that, that fans see, I think they want to see some of it is, is intentional what? and there are a lot of Easter eggs. Um, but, what? uh, I'm so stunned at that statement, but I will say this I, and I, I hope I'm not blowing up any theories and is dead and <laughs> hit her head okay. and she's gone. So, and I love, I love LaChance. I mean, she was great, but she's, she uh, was great. She, she was is so dead. Good. Yeah. You're going to break some hearts with that because, they, yeah, there's some real conspiracy theory. There's some real work to make that work for a lot well, of Well, look, maybe we should lean into that. Maybe I should take that back <laughs> and we should – can we edit that out? I'm joking. Yeah, no, she's gone. That's part of the tragedy of being – I think that story doesn't work if she's still alive. He That is the story of Red wanting to be a normal person. He goes into this woman's life and the tragedy is he destroys her and he can't be a normal person. So that that I, that I think is part of what that story is. And I think that's hard for the fans because it's like there there are some things like – you know, Aaron can clap as I say this, Tom's death, but mm-hmm. like, Tom's death needs to be there because Liz doesn't become the character she becomes without Tom's death. Kaplan, yeah. Kaplan's death has to stay. Great to see her back, by the way. Susan Blumart, fantastic to have uh, her back on the show. Yeah, it was fun. Um, but you can't have her back in real yeah. life because it just it ruins the story and the progression. So it's like even though the fans want certain things, it's definitely a better way to just, you know, these people are officially gone. Don't try to bring them back. You know, because when, when sometimes yeah. when you do, it just doesn't work. Yeah, I love the callbacks to previous seasons, especially with that. That was fun, especially a mental break. And I'm like, how are they going to work her in? Because NBC, of course, had to show her as soon as they could. <laughs> I know, and- <laughs> I know, you love that. Yeah. You love the promos. Uh, you know, part part of that I think is, um, look, you guys hung out and got to know Susan, and she's she's great. And part of part of me is like, how do we not have her back? Oh, I miss her. How can we work mm-hmm. her in? And you know. <sighs> It's just, it's a, um, I don't know. That's one of the fun parts of the, of the, the show is trying to, I don't know, just trying to be different and trying to mix it up and trying to surprise ourselves and, and having her back was, was great. I love her. I love having her on the show and, um, you know, it's just, it's old home week. It was fun to have her back. It's great. It's great. Um, what do you want to call it? Um, it's great fodder for us because, then you get to dissect it and go, well, is this Kaplan the way she was interacting with Red back in the day? Is this Kaplan being Kaplan or is this really Liz's inner being yeah. and how Liz's inner being is manifesting yeah. itself in a familiar face? And it's just like, like, how is she interpreting that? I mean, that's just that's just the juicy stuff to dive into. Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's Liz's manifestation of her, but I also think it's. I think that character in that episode was written as Kaplan would speak and feel. I think she knows that she made a mistake and didn't go far enough and that she have to become, you know, really that, let's be honest, that's that, that character in that episode was also a way to push Liz darker and to have a familiar friend that we like who died trying to get to this truth, who is like, Hey honey, it's okay. You need to be bad. It's easier for, I think that, that helped me try to sort of process and understand and accept Liz being bad. You know, that's one of those things that, I thought it was smart. It was very smart. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good to have her back. And going to 820, two big questions for me. Well, there's probably like 10, but this, this, these are the two big ones. One, the, the cage. Okay. That cage. I mean, I don't, I don't I'm not going to go into the breakout because we're talking about the box. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the cage. Who the hell's called it the cage? Eight the years you call Sorry. it the cage now? Like what the hell? That's I call it the cage, whatever. But you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna let the the ridiculous escape that's still kind of awesome. I'm gonna let that go <laughs> <laughs> because it was still awesome. So I, if you can make it awesome and it's ridiculous, I'm still on board. The where do they pee? I I just get that's a question I've always wanted to ask. Where's the bathroom? In that I thing? will send you guys a uh, photo. I think in the original box, I have a photo of myself and John Eisendrath and John Fox. We're all in the box. And I was shackled and John was asleep on the desk and John Fox was looking <laughs> at a computer going, what the hell is this show? I feel like there was a little toilet in the back. And I think the toilet might have might have gotten broomed because it just got weird. It was like, We're are we going to like come be? in and Red's like sitting on the toilet, you know, and it's like, <laughs> oh, so sorry, I'll... I'll, I'll be right back. Or like, could you, Hey guys, could you turn the lights off? You know, I think it be, it was something that became incredibly awkward and we, there might've been a little revisionist history there on the uh, orange box and the plumbing of the orange box. 
You can just see it now, like, this one time in Bangladesh, I took this massive dump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad, though, that that's a concern that you have, Aaron, that you're worried about. I, I really was. You know, I'm sitting there. Well, work? I mean, I've, I thought about it in season one, but then, you know, they put Liz in the box. And I'm like, what if she has to pee? I mean, that's not right. You can't. <laughs> like, there's no <laughs> curtains. There's nothing. Well, it's funny. That box was built in, uh, you know, in a pilot where they were spending a lot of money. We shot that in the old post office that was across the street from Madison Square Garden. And now it's like a subway station. They've renovated the whole thing. But there was this vast space in this big box. And it was on this mechanical thing. So it would roll back and the door would open. And there was a guy on a like a little tractor that would drive the tractor back to pull the box. And now we're on this little sound stage at Chelsea Piers, and every time we put the box, Laura Benson's like, "Oh my God, you guys, we don't have any room for that. We can't give it the look." And so, in tonight's episode, or in, in I watch it tonight in in episode eight twenty, there is um, if you look closely, there's a shot where a grenade goes off, and then there's also a shot or two where Liz is walking toward the box, where we steal footage from old episodes where we had more scope and more space oh, and okay. uh and and sort of like try to make it look like the old big orange box even though we're kind of all squeezed into a uh, little bit of a tighter space yeah i was wondering it, it kind of reminded me of ansel garrick and i was like did they steal from ansel garrick in order to make this happen it, it, yeah it wasn't ansel garrick but there was we've definitely been there a time or two uh you know over the years i feel like it was a was it a week or two ago? I don't know if you guys saw a promo. I heard the podcast and you were talking about how many times we've broken out of the orange box. And I was like, oh, no. The guys are going to show. It's coming again, guys. So, it was uh, still cool, though. It was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty cool. I mean, I was laughing. I'm like, this is the most ridiculous thing. And I still loved it. I still loved it's it. It's ridiculous. Though. And there's no fighter jets coming. They're flying right past the obelisk. And there's a whole... Um, you know, Spader wanted to put on and we got rid of it because you couldn't see it. But he we covered up the box and he wanted the outside of the box to be a moving company that said Ray Ray's moving and storage. <laughs> and I was like, James, OK, that's great. But th you're going a little too deep. No one's going to be able to see this. And they're going to be like, what did the box say? So, um, yeah, that's the funny. orange box. I, I don't know about the plumbing, but we'll definitely we should probably just put like a five gallon bucket in there. <laughs> and that can just be there where well, they do their business. The other question has to do with, uh, in my estimation, now I know there's a, there's a big tease that there, there's a lot of stuff coming in 821. I'm not, so we're not talking about that one yet. We're still on 820, but by my count, I got two answers in this episode. One, I can say is a hundred percent. And one, I think is like 98, 98%. But the one is the the scar on Liz's hand. We finally have an answer and a solution to that. That it's the waterways from um, what's Troy? What's the name of it? Baltic Sea. Yeah, Baltic Latvia. Sea. Thank you. Which which is really cool because I think people have always thought that. I think the other way around, where where the scar is a representative of something that happened in the fire, and that it's connected and it's going to be Rambaldi. I don't know what the hell they were thinking, but this um this is more of he shaped his business. Or, or the scar informed how he presented his business going forward, right? Like yeah, it became front, like, like the yeah. logo. It became the logo, essentially. Sort of a reminder for him of what had happened and something he didn't want to forget. And yeah, was that a, was that a signpost? That was one thing that you always knew was going to be that way. Yeah, in, in being, you know, <sighs> yes, a hundred percent. I, you know, the 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 box. So here's the thing: in the pilot. Tom, sorry, Aaron, mm -hmm. to bring up Tom, but Tom had a... Uh, He's got the box, I know, with the, with the design on it. And yep. so I remember vividly, and I feel it's sort of liberating. I feel like I can talk about this now. We, I went with John Eisendrath's former assistant, Jesse Gordon, who's a great guy. We were shooting at the apartment, which was their apartment. And we, they were like, what is the, uh, what is the money and the passports and the gun go in? And uh, do we have a, is it a bag or a trash bag or what is it? We had walked off for lunch to try to get away. And just sort of clear clear our heads or goof around. And we walked into this old antique shop, which was in the neighborhood. And we found this old box. And I was like, great, let's use this box. This is sort of old looking and funky. And when we went in, um, the uh, one of the art guys uh, said, well, what's the box? Do we just put anything on it? Does it say something? And I can't remember whose idea it was. But I remember standing there with Eisendrath when we decided it should be the scar. 
Like, let's do some thing. And so literally the day we were shooting that, probably two hours before, there's a guy in the basement of some house in Brooklyn with like carving tools, sketching out the scar on the top of the box. That's and, great. and, and, and that's where it came from. And at that moment, did we have any idea what it meant? Not at all. But, you know, you sort of sit with it and then maybe that, maybe that emblem shows up somewhere else. Maybe we see that later and, and it represents Tom and Red's connection. And did Gina know anything about it? What does it mean? And so, and, 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 and again, I think I want to get, t-shirts made that are the uh baltic's best seafood distribution you know <laughs> because because that's the logo because it reminds red of you know this terrible night that he now admits to being at and um and he saw the baltic scene it reminded him of it and so that became sort of a a totem for him to uh go back to and so yeah it was it had been there from the beginning but in various incarnations and this is sort of the fulfillment of that and sort of when, when I say we have answers coming up, it's that sort of thing. Like, you know, these things that we've speculated about for a long time start kind of connecting in a, in a way that they've never had before. Yeah. And I think when people, you know, especially when fans, when they talk about, well, they didn't have the whole thing mapped out. I think they think that showrunners and creators and, and executives and whatever have this book of every single thing that comes up, that comes up and they have it detailed to the final end when it's really just, we have basic construct we know who the guy is we know why he is who he is but we're going to add some stuff along the way to because you got a lot of gaps to fill in and a lot of time to fill in and i don't think they realize that and this kind of that story kind of alludes to look this became a big thing in the show but it started as very minor yeah 100 percent. and look that's that's true i remember talking to my buddy rich davidio who's a writer and we were on the the disney lot and we were talking about alias i had no idea who john eisendrath or any of these people were at that point but and i remember at the, he had mentioned yeah at the end of the episode the person goes up and hands her an envelope and she looks in it and goes oh my god and they cut to the black and that's the end of the episode and 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 i was like how does that work do they know what's on the envelope and my buddy rich is like they don't have any idea what's in the envelope. I'm like, really? He's like, they don't know, you know. And and look, there's an element of that, you know. I mean, but I think I think the one thing that is different about the show is that we've always known a truth about Red. We've always known why he's come into her life. We've always know, we we've always sort of worked toward a end point that um, has been a guiding light for us. And so, even though we sort of drift again, that's the signpost analogy. Even though we sort of drift now and then, and and um, and, you know, sort of tread water or find our way or, or improvise, there is a, a, a guiding light that we're sort of working towards. So um, it's a little bit of a high wire act that gets a little spooky at times, but, but, um, but uh, is always super fun in the best way possible. Now, the other truth, I think, I, I'm pretty sure it's a, the it's a truth, but, you know, you might, I know how you, how you can be, so maybe you'll get cagey about uh, it. No, I won't get cagey. Okay. All right. So one thing that he says, you know, before he says, this is, this is the blacklist. So we're going to find out exactly what the blacklist means in the next episode. We're not going to know. We don't know yet. It's, we're looking into the abyss and wondering what that is, but he did say, and he said in previous episodes, Liz, she wasn't your mother. You know, he told her that in previous episodes. So <clears throat> most fans have thought, or many fans have thought that wasn't really Katarina. That was a plant or something along those lines. In this episode, he w kind of revisits that and says something along the lines of, um, you know, you, the sole purpose of this whole thing was so that I could keep you safe and your mother hidden, which to me indicates her mother's still hidden, not present. We haven't seen her mother, or officially Katerina. Would you say that that's a truth or would you say you're going to have to wait until 821 for that, Aaron? I would say both. I would say that is true. And you're going to have to wait to 821 to see what that means. But, um, ah. and, and, and 821, look, there's some interpretation there. You know, it's, it's not like Reddington. Spader said this a long time ago. The less you know about him, the, the more interesting he is. You know, like, let's not have him be in every scene. And so I am a firm believer that leaving, leaving a little something open to interpretation is important. And we definitely, we, we do that, but, but yeah, he, I mean, he admitted in 20 to being in 13 to mm -hmm. having the uh, Sikorsky archive, which was given to him by a friend that your mother was not killed, which he has said repeatedly. And um, and that he was 
you know, sort of put on this earth to both hide Katerina and to keep Elizabeth safe, you know? And so, yeah, I think you can take all that um, uh, at face value. Very Great. liberating. Huh? How about oh, that? That's oh, that's kind of good. Huh? giving you an actual answer. <laughs> Wow, this is like talking to my therapist. This is so uh, <laughs> cathartic. <laughs> was was there okay? So since you gave me a real answer, was there any concern about um, reactions to people once they realize that Liz has been angry about something that Red could have really resolved early on, or that she's angry about something that really you know someone that wa- wasn't really uh, look one hundred percent. I understand the question. Why hasn't Red told her? And, and again, I think, I think after you watch 21, this will make more sense. But I think okay. the, the logic is Reddington has been hiding tr- a, 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 a truth and really a truth about, you know, her mother and her involvement and who she is and, and how she's connected to Liz. He's been trying to protect her, right? If you, you know, and, and, and by the way, th- there's evidence of that in, you know, Liz and wrestler go asking questions about Katarina Rostova and yeah. all these people come looking for them and she ends up, you know, and even, uh, you know, well, it just, it becomes very complicated and it becomes very messy. He has tried to keep Katarina Rostova hidden away and Liz poking around and asking questions or anyone asking questions is problematic. Now Townsend has found out a truth, which again, it, it stings a little when you point out that there's a whisper that, uh, you know, the, the, so the Sophia, uh, Coppola, you know, uh, Bill Murray, uh, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson whisper. What did they say? Townsend knows. And now that Townsend knows it is, uh, I think red is at a point where he realizes it is now more dangerous to not tell her the truth. And that is a first in the series where he is like, you know what? This is, I have to tell her. And that's, that's where we're going. That's where we're going in the next episode. When he tells her, is he going to whisper it? He will whisper it and you will not hear a word of it. <laughs> that sounds about right. Just you, Aaron. That sounds Just about you. right. <laughs> it will be actually the audio sort of drops out and it will feel like you'll be banging the side of your TV. And, uh, no, he, he it, it, look, can I, can I give you the tease of next week's episode? Yes, give us, yes, give us the tease. Please. Give us the tease. It, 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 it's so, I'm so excited about this. It is so weird it is we've done some stuff that breaks our format and goes outside of the sort of case of the week and the sort of little indie movies we do like uh like ruin or uh cape may this is a head trip this is a weird surreal uh pandora's box of answers and um it is as long as NBC doesn't cancel this in the next uh, week. Uh, it is in black and white. Uh, James called, uh, you know, one day and said, "I had this idea. I had to write it down on the back of a, a note that I had by my bedside table, black and white. We got to do this." It is a weird confluence of it's sort of a beautiful thing, I think, coming together between. I was going to go direct this episode, mm-hmm. and. Um, and I ended up being too far behind on scripts. So I called my good friend, Kurt Kenny, who came in to direct it. And Kurt oh, has directed yeah. a ton of black and white movies. And James had this black and white vision. And Kurt, because he's a dear friend, really understands the show in a way like the writers do on the show and in a, in a, in a, a way that you guys do, right? Like mm-hmm. he, he was calling out things in the script. He said, you're wrong here. You're, you're showing a, uh, a flashback of this moment and it wasn't in that order. I mean, he was able to vet it in ways that, that oh, were just cool. amazing. So it's a really, it's a really unusual, um, sort of answer, I think. And, and, and it really is as much of a period as we can put on the sentence, um, while leaving just enough open to, uh, push ahead. It is, it is, the, it is, it is massive closure on the story that has been at the center of the series, you know? And again, that doesn't mean that the series is over. That doesn't mean that the, that, that, you know, there's not more story to tell and that we don't want to go on this journey, but we are going to bring, um, we're going to bring closure to a, a really important story that's been at the center of the series for eight years. And that's what we've always said, right? That's what we yeah, said. I think most fans would be happy with Give that. Give us the yeah. answer, which can open up a slew of new stories and a slew of new questions. And I yeah. love the fact that 
the the title of the episode Nachello, right, is uh is the beginning in in Russian. Yeah. And so it's like we almost like get a get a reset on the show in a way. Like that season Real. 9 could go anywhere, which is great. Have they released the title of uh, 22? I don't think I've seen the press release yet. Um it, it's not, not pr- officially I, released. I don't remember the um the Russian word uh because it's also in Russian, but it's um the ending. So the two episodes are a little bit of a companion in a way. Um, the beginning and the ending are um, these next two episodes, which are, are again are are massive, massively sort of significant in the in the life of the show. Which means that number two is still open for debate for <laughs> season nine. Number two <laughs> is still open. Yes. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Liz was number one on the blacklist. What was the? How did that come to be? that Liz would become number one. Well, that just felt like a natural, um, a natural sort of space for her. She's the person we know the best. You know, if we, if we came in and said, uh, you know, Sven, the blacklister is number one. Oh, okay. Who's Sven? We don't really know who he is. And <laughs> yeah. why do we care? It, it felt like it's somebody we know. It's somebody who, you know, really knows Reddington better than anyone. It is somebody who who has learned at the feet of the master and has um, and and poses incredible threats to him. And so that's really where that came from. You know, the two the two of them, what they've learned from each other, and really trying to put Liz at the forefront of um, of the series in a way. You know, in terms of who she is to Reddington, who she was, who she's become, the threats that she poses. And so um, that's kind of where that came from. That. That uh, we I, we've had that in mind for quite a while, I think. The fact that you are finally at a point where, I, 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 unless I'm mistaken, many people are finally going to get some of the answers they want to to some of the questions that have been kind of sure covering the fandom for for some time. We've been covering for many many years. How do you, how does that make you feel as someone who has been writing to that Porsche that that solution for so many years? Do you feel like oh thank God, I'm almost there. <laughs> and and are you are you happy that you no longer have to do that thing? And I always feel bad because even when we've had to interview you, it's like pe- fans always want to ask you, like, tell us what's coming up. Tell us about what this character is. And you can never answer that. All you can ever say is, uh, you know, like you always do, is just kind of dance around it and so, say yeah. what you, people already know because you can't give away anything. Are you glad that you don't have to do that anymore? Yeah, I am. Um, I, I think... I don't like that tease aspect of it. Anytime you do an interview with not you guys, cause I, I I've gotten to know you guys so well, but if you're doing an interview with the magazine or something, you're all, Hey, can you give us a tease of next week? You know, it's, it's such a trope. They know that fans want to know something. And I go through all the photos, like what betrays story stuff, what's a spoiler and every mm-hmm. image and stuff. And it's, it's really hard to protect that. And, and it's also incredibly hard to keep it, keep the mythology straight. Like I said, you know, Kurt, Kurt being a director and a good friend, but a fan of the show is like, Hey, you messed up here. You know, you can't do that. And that, that's sort of a, a spooky thing. Um, uh, I'll tell you, uh, the, the episode, uh, 20 with Godwin page, Godwin became the blacklister because I think it was 16 or 17 where he and Blake Brown, the African American woman who was working for Townsend, we saw them get arrested. Two or three episodes went by and, and then I was like, everyone's looking for Townsend. No one knows where they are. Red doesn't know the task force. What happened? We arrested these guys. Didn't we talk to them? Did anybody interview them? <laughs> and so the, so he became the blacklister by virtue of us needing to explain he got away and he was not interviewed and he escaped. That's the sort of audible that we're, we're calling. Those are the kinds of things that keep me up at night when I go, oh, my God, this guy, you know, we, we – we got a we got a hole here, and I think we've been very good at going back and closing those holes, and and uh, you know really threading the needle. But the idea of of sort of bringing closure to a lot of the story is satisfying. But again, I think it I think what you guys are going to find in twenty one is it's it is definitely open for some interpretation. But we are going to answer a lot of story when we go back to the night of the fire. We go back to Katarina and who she was and Stepanov and who he was and where this sort of Reddington that is James Spader that we know of, where he came from and how it, how that, how those pieces fit together. Again, I think it's more of 
that puzzle coming together when you look at it and whether you see, you know, what are those paintings when you look at it and you see the, you either see the big eyeball looking back at you or you don't, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like those, Mm -hmm. those sort of visual things. I think it's a little bit like that. The story all comes together. The pieces fit what it means to you is uh, perhaps open to interpretation, but I think we're really going to bring closure and, and answers to a lot of, a lot of things that have been big holes in the mythology for a long time. Will some of our questions be in, like the ones that we a- ask on a regular basis that we fight about? I'm not going to say specifically what they are. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, look, you guys are so <sighs> good at drilling down on the, on, again, I, I say like the Night of the Fire or Dom and his, you know, Ilya and his relationship to Katarina or Dom and this weird, I say family in a metaphorical way, but it is a family, this weird family and, and you know, bringing back a lot of actors who have have been on the show. Um, Yeah, I think, uh, I hope you guys feel like there's answers. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. I don't want to be part of the conversation, but I can't wait to hear what you think, you know, and what it, what it means and how you interpret it and, um, and what you think it means going forward. Look, it wouldn't be the blacklist if you couldn't look at it in two different ways, right? Like that, that's maybe what's so good about your podcast. Uh, You can, you can sort of see, it's open and it's not necessarily a lexical ambiguity. That's not the right word for it, but just sort of, again, open to interpretation. But I think, um, but I think, I think, I hope fans are really satisfied with sort of seeing how all this comes together and, and then where it goes in the next episode, I can't even, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, well, you just gotta, you just gotta see it. But we will get some concrete. There's there's some concrete answers, though. There are some yes. things where you can walk out going, now you know. Yes. Now you know. You, you will know. I think you will know when you walk out of that episode, you will know a, a great majority of, of the DNA of the show. You know, you will understand things and characters and people we've seen and how they came to know each other and why they were in places and, you know, everything from – the fulcrum to uh, Reddington and his family and Carla and Dom and Illy, you know, it's sort of that web and how that web ties together. That's really what this episode's about. And like I say, it's weird as hell, but whatever. After eight years, if you can't go do some weird black and white episode <laughs> that probably uh, a lot of people will go, what the hell was that? What's the point? You know, you gotta, you gotta mix it up a little bit. And shout out to Kurt, the director, because he yeah. did Dear Zachary, which I did see that documentary. That's the one where his friend's um, girlfriend or his, his friend was murdered. And he kind of like puts this like really poignant documentary together. Dear Very Zachary. Sweet. Yeah. It, Kurt's one of Kurt's best friends was murdered by a, a woman who he was dating and who ultimately had uh, his friend's child. And Dear Zachary is so good. I it's it's heart wrenching, and I feel like I lived it with him. You know, in a way that he was sort of experiencing this as it happened, and he was talking about making the movie. But he's such a great documentarian, and in a way, that's why, uh, you know, when James talks about Twenty One being in black and white and being sort of a document, it is a little bit of a document. It's interesting that we have a documentary filmmaker coming mm-hmm. in to sort of document the evidence of the past eight years and how it fits. Uh, that that to me is really interesting. It's not somebody who's looking for just sort of sweeping fun shots. It's somebody who's really trying to tell a, tell a story as a document. And I think, I hope that's what, what 21 becomes uh, for everyone. And 21 is right around the corner. As a reminder, everybody, we're moving to Wednesday nights in the States. It's Wednesday night at 10 Eastern, 9 Central. June 16th is 821. June 23rd will be 822. And the season eight finale uh, make sure you set your DVRs or Peacock or Netflix or whatever the hell you're watching on these days. And it's going to be an absolute <laughs> riot to finish out the eighth season of The Blacklist. John, as always, thanks so much for being here. It's always a blessing to have you come by and just just be so candid and open and at least, you know, definitively put something in the ground for a change. Well, look, don't don't go too far with that, Troy. We're not, nothing is definitive. But uh, no, come on. I, I Look, you guys have been awesome. I really love listening to the show. It is so interesting to hear everyone sort of theories and how close to the bone they get some of them that are completely whacked out but some of them that are really kind of i'm like uh oh we're getting a little close there so that's always really it's fu- it's fun to hear and I, I i appreciate your guys um insight and sort of detail with which you watch it's always it's it's super super cool to see thanks for having me Ugh. 
Well, that was super stellar, Aaron. It's always good to talk to John. It's weird. Like moving to Wednesdays, we're in June. Like, I feel like Blacklist is never going to end. Yeah, I don't understand when we're in June. Like I, I'm supposed to be on summer break right now. So this is affecting my, my pool time. I just got a pool. <laughs> I want to be in my pool a little bit more. But it's been a great close to a season. And I, I got to say, I have heard so many great things about the upcoming episode. The one that John's referencing, the one that he's teasing and he can't tell you too much about. So I think we're finally going to get many of the answers we want. And I can't wait. You know what's behind the door of that bunker? The blacklist. A pool. Just for you. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. The blacklist is actually just a Olympic sized swimming pool. That yeah. would be weird. It but be he weird. said it's a weird episode, so that would be pretty weird. There you go. The question is is the water black or is the water white? I don't know how that films if you film it that way. I don't know. I uh, that would be oil, wouldn't it? I don't understand that analogy. So what did you uh what do you, what is your thoughts? Do you this is your last ditch effort for nailing down any of the mythology stuff to see what gets answered? I think that this was a, a good tease. I'm really excited going into these next two weeks. Uh, we'll fig- have to figure out how to do the podcast for all of you guys since we're moving to Wednesdays instead of Fridays. So we'll just have to figure out the schedule and how that all works out. But this is the most excited I think I've been since like maybe season four or five for the show. Like there's like, like, ooh, like what is down there? What's behind the door? Is it, are we going to find our- you know, Rimbaldi stuff in the basement. I don't know. <laughs> it looked really ancient and kind of like a Mayan ruin kind of. And it's just like, what? what is this place? And why is it here in, in Latvia? And it, it, so many questions. And I think it's going to be so awesome. I can't wait to see what happens in the next two weeks. So you totally did not answer my question. Like what, what, what are you calling your shots there, Babe Ruth? What, what mythology things do you think you know for sure are going to be the answer? next week well i think there's only one mythology thing that i need to know an answer to and that's the identity of raymond reddington and i don't know if that i don't know if we're going to get that answer because season nine is still around the corner i think the the big ones for this season were already answered in 820 which was is it fake katarina or not fake katarina and from the dialogue in 820 i believe that that's an answer we know that reds n13 that's an answer the, the scar was about the Baltic Sea. That's an answer. So I think there's just, there's a lot of that stuff. Like the the intermediary things that happen over the course of the years about, you know, the house and Tacoma and, you know, the ballerina girl and the bubble girl. It's like none of that stuff really mattered to me as much as it was like this core mystery of what is the relationship between the two of them and why is he in her life and who the hell is he at the end of the day because he's not the original Raymond Reddington that was Liz's father. So I think some of that, the core mysteries, those are still going to come in the next two weeks. I think the big answer, though, of who he is, you're not going to get that until 9, 10, 11, 20, 40, 50. <laughs> yeah, but I think we're going to get Liz's connection. Yes. To Red. To 100%. Degree. And what some of the other characters, their relationship are and how they're all connected. And I still say it's some kind of spy factory farm that Dom was raising them. And they were like... I don't want to say they're brother, sister, but they're brother Lee, sister Lee. They're connected in that respect because they're being raised to be spies or something along those lines. That feels like it might be true, but we'll see. It's like the Toretto family without cars. (laughs) Yeah. People just keep popping up that weren't in the last film. Yep. Totally. Just like that. It's exactly like that, but I'm excited. It's going to be great. Like I can't wait. Okay, well, that's going to do it for this episode. So come back next week when we break down 821. That episode is going to be fantastic, I think. Let's see what happens. Black and white. Cross your fingers that that actually holds. NBC, if you're listening, don't change it. <laughs> well, I'm sure the promo's out by now, and they probably already told us what happened at the that's end. That's probably true, probably true. Oh, well, wait. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5 Popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media Production.
Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.